Well, thank you so much um, uh, for inviting us to be a part of these of this conference. Um, we've had, I, I think I can speak for pr probably Brendan as well to, and say that we've had a really wonderful time and that uh, all of you at the Universidad de Nevada and UNIER have been wonderfully gracious hosts. Yeah, you've made it very hard to leave and us all both very eager, I think, to return. Um, in the interest of keeping things moving, I'm going to try to keep my talk relatively brief so we have uh, time to uh, discuss, because I've, I've learned a lot from all of you, and I hope we can continue. Um, and uh, although I have to say the earlier, the earlier uh, lectures have caused me a lot of problems because they've given me so many ideas that I've been trying to revise my comments uh, in, the, in the notes, um, hopefully it won't, it won't be too disjointed. Um, do I have a... Is my Um, so I've, I've titled my talk, How Do You Teach a University to Flourish? The description uh, underneath reads, John Harvard, founder, 1638. And the three lies are, first, that Harvard was not founded in 1638, uh, but 1636. Uh, that John Harvard was not the founder of Harvard, uh, but just a very important early benefactor. And that the man in the statue is not actually John Harvard. <laughs> Um, we don't know what he looked like, so this is just a sort of spiritual impression of what this magnanimous man must have, must have been like. Um, I put that up there because my talk is really, uh, the title for my talk really contains three lies as well, and I want to confess that at the outset. Um, the first uh, is that you are the one who must or can teach a university to flourish. Um, but in fact, that's a job that's bigger than any one individual or an, even any in individual group. Uh, universities are big places, they're diverse places with a lot of people, and flourishing is a difficult thing. Uh, the second lie is that uh, flourishing and character, which is related as we'll talk about a little bit, is something that can be easily or simply taught. Um, it is quite a different thing than, say, the periodic table of elements or the, the names of the wives of Henry VIII. Um, these things can be learned in uh, just a few minutes with some application and some flashcards. Um, but flourishing and character are not of that sort of thing. And the third lie, and the, the worst of them all, is implicit, uh, and that is that I have the answer to this question. Um, I have only very partial answers to this question, some thoughts that I'll share with you. Um, but like all of you, I am a student as well. Well, the Human Flourishing Program was started five years ago, just over five years ago at Harvard, by Tyler Vanderweel, who is our, our current director and a professor in the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, at its founding, it had Tyler, the director, uh, a philosopher named Jeff Hansen, who is still with our program, and one postdoc. Today, five years later, we have more than a dozen full-time researchers in a range of fields, so we've grown quite quickly. Um, and we have a, a two-fold goal, two-fold mission that hasn't changed. The first is to study and promote human flourishing. So it's a research goal, but also an application goal or a goal to promote flourishing. Brandon is going to talk in some more depth about our research mission in a minute, uh, so I won't dwell on that very much. I'm going to mostly talk about our, our approach to promoting flourishing on the Harvard campus among students and faculty. Uh, the second part of our mission is interdisciplinarity, intentional interdisciplinarity. As I said, we have a staff of about a dozen researchers. I am a historian. I uh, study intellectual and religious history in early modern Europe. Brendan is a theologian. We have two philosophers on staff. And the rest of our staff, the majority, are social scientists, uh, scholars from sociology, psychology, and public health. Now, interdisciplinarity is quite an important part of both our research uh, and our outreach. Um, in the 1950s, the British scientist and novelist C.P. Snow proposed or, uh, or observed that there were developing two uh, non-overlapping cultures in British intellectual life, the sciences and the humanities. And he, he observed that these two cultures really didn't understand each other. He was, in fact, particularly critical of the humanities, and he famously observed how many scholars of literature, if you ask them what's the second uh, law of thermodynamics, could actually answer the question. And I won't tell you whether I know, um, because I don't. Um, and uh, so C.P. Snow was particularly harsh on British universities and, and the development of these two cultures. Um, but I think all of us recognize what he's talking about. Uh, in our experience, in the experience of our program, the social sciences often struggle to deal with the human condition and all of its complexity, while the humanities often struggle to discuss contemporary trends uh, and to apply the, the, its work. 
So we think it's very important to combine the, the insights of both the humanities and the sciences. Um, the two cultures should not be competitors, but can actually save each, each other from making uh, many mistakes. Well, our outreach efforts at Harvard are similarly trying to bridge these cultures to help students and faculty learn from one another. Um, there are some challenges. I'll probably never be much of a statistician, um, but none of the disciplines can claim complete knowledge of flourishing, and so we need each other. Well, what do we mean by flourishing? Um, that's an important question. I think it's essentially what human civilizations have sought since time immemorial. We could use a number of different words for it. From the Hebrew tradition, shalom. From the Greek philosophical tradition, eudaimonia. Um, broadly speaking, it's a state in which everything in one's life or at least the most important, thing, important things in one's life, are going well. The director of our program, Tyler, proposed a set of dimensions a few years ago, which you can see on the screen. Uh, most would concur that flourishing, however conceived, would at the very least require doing or being well in the following five broad domains of human life. Happiness and life satisfaction, health, both mental and physical, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, and close social relationships. Now, many of these dimensions are entirely uncontroversial. Um, who could possibly object to physical health or happiness as a dimension of flourishing? Um, the element in this, in this definition that causes the most objections is virtue and character. Uh, mention of virtue in the world of public health, which is Tyler's uh, discipline, causes people to get very nervous. It's often read as religious, and people wonder if there really could be such a thing, or at least a concrete definition of virtue that didn't dissolve into subjectivity entirely. I suspect that I probably won't need to convince this audience that virtue belongs on this list, but as a thought experiment, we can all imagine a man who makes a very good living, um, but does it in a very abusive way. Say he exploits the poor in an abusive factory. He might be doing extremely well in measures of domains one, two, three, and five. He's quite happy about what he's doing. He's in peak physical, physical condition. He finds a great deal of meaning in building an e industrial empire and he is surrounded by family and friends who adore him. But as someone whose life is built on that kind of injustice really flourishing, is that a life we would seek or commend to others? I think all of us probably have the intuition that it's not, that there's something amiss in that life. We have to have this dimension of virtue if we want to talk about flourishing in its ultimate and most important sense. And I'll just mention that if you read the ancient wisdom traditions, a virtue is often seen as the most important, maybe the only essential component in this list. It is better to be a Job who suffers in righteousness than a wicked man who prospers. And that actually brings me to my very favorite image of flourishing, and one that guides my thinking in a lot of ways. It's from Psalm 1, and I've given it to you in Spanish and English. Um, Psalm 1 is really the introduction to the entire book of Psalms. It gives you an argument for why you should read and consider the Psalms, the book of Psalms as a whole. Uh, I'll read it uh, to you. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers." Now this picture, this image of a tree, is of course an allusion to the tree of life that we find at the beginning of the Hebrew Bible uh, in Genesis 3, and at the very end of the New Testament in Revelation 22, a picture of life flourishing in all of its dimensions. Now we can notice the features of this tree, or this man who is like a tree. He is solidly planted, not e easily moved, unlike the chaff which is blown away by the slightest gust of wind. He is continually refreshed. He doesn't go through periods of, of dryness. He is fruitful, and because he brings forth fruit, he is a blessing to those around him. His leaf does not wither, a beautiful image of health. And then to sum it up, in all that he does, he prospers. Well, what could possibly be a better image or definition of flourishing? The thing that strikes me most about this text is how this man comes to flourish. We read that it's through meditation on the Torah, the law, the instruction of God. It's careful consideration of the tradition that gives wisdom. It's that meditation which allows the man to find lasting life and to give that life to others. But it's not that the man only studies the law. He doesn't even only meditate on the law. He applies himself to it. He meditates on it. 
and crucially, he delights in it. It is the love of wisdom that we find commended so often in the Hebrew Bible and in other wisdom traditions, and it is the love of wisdom, in the love of wisdom, that we find virtue. Now, I am a historian by training, and I occupy several roles at the Human Flourishing Program, and one of the most important is I oversee and run our outreach to the Harvard community. That includes students, particularly undergraduates, um, but also faculty, as we have opportunity. Um, and this is an area that our program has begun investing in much more intensively uh, over the last year or two. Um, so we are a little bit different than some of the other programs that have been talked about in that we are part of Harvard, Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences, but we are not embedded in an academic department, so we are not primarily curricular in how we, in, 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 in how we contribute to the Harvard community. We do have uh, researchers who teach courses, for credit courses, within academic departments, um, but sometimes um, we have to convince those departments to partner with us. Um, so we have to think a lot about the different kinds of programming that we do and how those different kinds of programming uh, contribute to the mission. We're also working always to find faculty who are committed to this vision, or at least to a part of this vision, and willing to be partners with us, um, which is sometimes harder uh, to do than you might think. Uh, Harvard has a number of, uh, any, any number of brilliant and accomplished faculty, um, but they tend to be very busy and often building empires of their own, uh, and so don't always have time to contribute uh, to those of others. Uh, this is a rough goal for our uh, uh, kind of campus engagement. The Human Flourishing Program seeks to help members of the Harvard community engage with the best of human tradition in order to learn to live lives characterized by virtue, meaning, and truth. You can see the echoes of Psalm 1 uh, in this statement. Now, we are not a sectarian program. Um, so Psalm 1, we should note, does not just urge people to consider tradition in, in its most general form, but a very specific tradition. Um, we have researchers and staff in our program of a variety of backgrounds, religious and political convictions. Some of, them I know, uh, some of them I know about, some of them I'm not even sure what people believe. Um, but part of this engaging with tradition does require us to think very deeply about religion. And that's one of, I think, the most important ways we contribute to the intellectual community at Harvard. It is in religious texts that human beings have done some of their most profound reflection on flourishing. Um, we also want to engage with philosophical and literary and scientific traditions. Um, so this includes very ancient traditions, like some that like we've already discussed, but also very modern ones. A great deal of recent social science, for example, uh, which is some of the uh, some of the chief outputs of our program. So hopefully that sounds good, but there are challenges and problems as, we, as we've already talked about. Um, one of the challenges, um, some of the challenges, I suspect, are similar to those that you face at your institutions. Um, Harvard is a place of extraordinary resources, intellectual and otherwise. The students are almost embarrassingly brilliant. Um, the libraries are among the largest in the world. The faculty is world-renowned. Um, but the culture is not always one that promotes the kind of seeking after wisdom, the kind of flourishing that we've been discussing. Uh, and American universities, and Harvard is certainly no exception, uh, are increasingly intellectual monocultures, places where dissent is punished uh, and where, where students and faculty are afraid to speak out. There was just a major new piece of research uh, published just a few days ago in the American Sociological Review that showed that college in America has the effect of pushing students to the left, um, that's probably not surprising, but also making them moral absolutists. Um, so increasingly, uh, students are less tolerant of opinions that differ with them. Uh, but we believe that universities like Harvard should be places of free exchange, even if they aren't. I run a reading group for Harvard students, um, and this semester our theme is speech, intellectual conformity, and disagreement. And we have a very thoughtful group of students. And just last week, I asked them if they had, if there were deeply held moral, political, or religious beliefs that they were afraid to talk about publicly at Harvard. And to an individual, the students said yes, absolutely. There were ideas that they were afraid to give voice to in the, within the Harvard community. And it wasn't primarily the, the sanction uh, or censor of, censorship of professors that they worried about, it was their peers. And they were worried that they would face social ostracism uh, or other kinds of, kind of social, social punishment uh, if they crossed a line. This is something they're very, uh, very concerned about uh, and, and quite, quite worried about. Um, this is perhaps a familiar problem to those of us who care about intellectual culture on campus. Um, but I think just as important is the sort of careerism of many students and faculty. 
Um, every student wants to get a job after graduation, and I think those of us who are educators want to help them do that, to kind of set them on their way in life. Um, but there is a danger um, that students are so focused on, on vocational goals that they don't ever take time to stop and reflect about what an education is even for in the first place. Multiple times, again and again, I've talked to students who've told me uh, some version of the se sentence, what I really love is history, but I'm study e studying economics. What I really love is philosophy, but I'm, I'm studying computer science. Um, and Harvard actually makes it difficult to do both, um, so they often have to choose. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with studying economics or, or computer science. I think those are intellectually fulfilling and important disciplines. Um, but students at Harvard often feel a very intense pressure to get a return on their investment. Um, they don't start preparing for Harvard towards the end of high school. They often start pre preparing for Harvard in primary school. Um, it's a many years trek that uh, takes incredible discipline and investment. And so once they get there, um, they are, they're quite concerned about being knocked off track. Um, I, I, uh, I, since I've been at Harvard for a little over a year, and I, I found uh, kind of a, 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 somewhat to my surprise that when I want to meet up with a Harvard student, um, I'm often given very narrow windows in their schedule. They'll tell me, I have 3.20 to 3.45 on Thursday. I'll send you a Google Calendar invite. Um, and I'm, and I, I'm like, I think I'm pretty busy, but these students are so overscheduled. Um, it's, a, it's extraordinary. And so I've taken as part of my mission to kind of get them to stop and pause and reflect and actually think about what it is that they're doing. Um, there are excellent reasons to work hard at, at, in, 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 your, in, your, in your courses, um, to pursue a demanding career, but if the practical comes at the expense of wisdom, I think all of us would agree that something has gone wrong. Um, I think I, yeah. Related to this is actually a, a more, even more troubling crisis, and that students at Harvard are struggling profoundly with mental health. Uh, you would think that Harvard of all places would be a place where students should flourish. The students are young and typically in good health. They have incredibly bright futures. They are the ma future masters of the universe, and they know it. Um, they are off they're typically brilliant and talented. When you meet a Harvard undergraduate, you'll realize that this is a very bright individual. But then you'll also find that they're a very co accomplished uh, violinist as well, or that they have a, a chess title um, that, and, are, and, are, and are a competitive chess player. I mean, they, they've done it all. Brilliant neuroscientists, brilliant musicians, um, brilliant artists, and on and on. Um, recently though, just last year, Harvard released a report on student mental health, and I just want to read an excerpt from, from the abstract. This is what uh, last year Harvard, Harvard concluded. Our investigation confirmed that Harvard students are experiencing rising levels of depression and anxiety disorders, and high and widespread levels of anxiety, depression, loneliness, and other conditions. In addition to all of their overwork, Extracurricular activities, rather than providing unqualified relief, often represented another source of competition and stress. One of the most curious features of Harvard is that many student clubs are actually competitive. Um, you, have to, you have to apply to get into them. Um, so Harvard students are very trained to excel in the admissions process for colleges. Fewer than 5% of all students who apply to Harvard are accepted. Um, then once they get there, they replicate the, this admissions process for their extracurricular activities. And so I've heard students talking about the fact that they're in a club which is non-selective and then start scheming, how can we make this selective so that we can uh, exclude people and thereby boost its prestige? Um, this is a source of enormous anxiety at Harvard. Um, and it's not just the, the kind of famous secret societies that you might see in, in the social network or something else like that. Um, it's even like the investment club or the debate club and these sorts of things. Now this same problem with student mental health is, is reproduced at every elite university uh, in, in America. Uh, the the uh, campus counseling and psychological services um, departments at these, at these universities cannot hire counselors fast enough. They add counselors every year and they can never keep up with demand. Um, now there are lots of reasons for this. But one of them, surely, is that we haven't taught students to think about what an education is for. We haven't given them a sense of how they should develop as human beings. We haven't introduced them to the pursuit of wisdom. This isn't a crisis that can be solely reduced to brain chemistry. More and more students feel deeply anxious about their future and about their place in their own community. 
They don't know why they are studying what they're studying, other than they have to work very hard at it, and they aren't sure who can help them find meaning and purpose. Well, if that isn't enough, we can go to a second problem, and that is the weakness of our tools. Uh, the weakness of our tools. I am a historian um, by training, uh, intellectual and religious history primarily. I also love literature, and there's another version of my life in which I am a, a not, probably a failed novelist. Um, I wish very much that reading great books consistently uh, and directly led to growth in character and flourishing. Um, but the sad fact of history is that the great villains and heroes often read the same books. Um, and in fact, the, many of the philosophers and poets who wrote our favorite books were not role models, shall we say. When I travel internationally, I often like to take a book, a, a, a novel to read that has some bearing on it. So I once read, I first read Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, uh, which I highly recommend. Um, for this trip, I, re I brought some Hemingway, who was, of course, not only a great American novelist, but a great lover of Spain, or at least a certain version of Spain with bullfights and that sort of thing. Um, he was not someone that you would hold up as a model of, say, marital fidelity or moderation. Um, a great writer who we can learn from, but not perhaps a moral exemplar. So if that's true, and I think it clearly is, what is the use of reading this books, these books? Well, this brings me to the Stoic philosopher Seneca. Uh, in his uh, apolog Apologizing for the length of this quotation, this is from uh, one of Seneca's moral letters. Uh, Seneca, the great Stoic philosopher, um, and this is his, from his letter 88. This is what he said in directly answering this question. Does the studying of the liberal arts promote virtue? Some thinkers have judged that we should ask whether liberal arts make a man good. But they, the liberal arts, don't even promise this and lay claim to this knowledge. Grammar is preoccupied with care for speech. And if it wants to spread further about histories and to extend its boundaries to the limit about poetry, which of these lays a path towards virtue? So do liberal studies bring us no advantage? Much for other purposes, but nothing for virtue. And that's troubling. For even those openly worthless arts worked by hand contribute a lot to the tools of life, but are, are relevant to virtue. So why do we train our sons in liberal arts? Not because these arts can bestow virtue, but because they prepare the mind to accept virtue. Just as that first lettering, as the men of old called it, by which the alphabet was passed on to boys, does not teach the liberal arts, but prepares a place for taking them in presently, so the liberal arts do not lead the mind up to virtue, but get it ready. What Seneca is saying is that the liberal arts, the study of great books, are a kind of ABC. Uh, they, are, they are giving us a moral vocabulary that allows us to reason ethically, to reflect upon our lives and our, on, our, on our history. Uh, this, is a, this is a kind of a study that is necessary, but not sufficient for growth in virtue. Now I should mention also that Seneca has very good reason to reflect on the failings of liberal education because he was the personal tutor, uh, tutor to the Emperor Nero. Uh, and, and Nero, of course, burned Rome to the ground and murdered his own mother, and then had uh, ordered uh, Seneca to commit suicide. Um, so there are, this is a worst case scenario of a great book's curriculum. Um, hopefully hopefully it, your, your experience won't be quite so bad, uh, but Seneca knew, knew from, from firsthand experience uh, that it didn't always take. All right, where does this leave us? Well, if we think back to Psalm 1, remember, we learned that we don't just need instruction in virtue, but we also need to learn to love wisdom. Love is something we learn from others. It develops within relationships. And so if we want to promote virtue and flourishing in our students, we need to proceed with instruction, yes, but together with friendship. Now, I suspect that the social scientists here could actually point me to good empirical research on this question. Uh, our program, the Human Flourishing Program, is currently about to launch a, an international multi-year project on the measurement of love. Um, but I'm a historian, so I will just point out that this is generally how the great teachers of the past, the great teachers of flourishing and virtue, have gone about things. They have gathered small communities of intellectual friends around them. They have lived life together. Uh, and they have sought to grow in virtue together. So Socrates and Plato attracted followers and disciples and shared life. Um, Jesus had 12 disciples. Paul always took one or two along on his journey. Uh, shortly after his conversion, St. Augustine wanted to retreat to Cassiacum, a, a kind of, kind of proto-monastic retreat uh, with friends to explore philosophy and pursue truth together. 
I'm a historian of early modern Europe, and particularly the religious reformations of the 16th century. This is what Martin Luther did. Uh, Martin Luther gathered students who not only learned from his lectures, but actually lived in his home and ate at his table. Um, Ignatius of Loyola assembled a small band of followers, which would eventually become the Jesuit order. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist order, led the Holy Club at Oxford. And we could on, go on and on and multiply examples, um, but I think you get the point. Now, neither instruction nor friendship are sufficient alone. Uh, friendship creates conditions of trust, the possibility for correction and for modeling personal growth, and it also inflames the heart um, towards virtue, at least it can, whereas instruction provides the principles and the goals. Now, I should also note here that this is not solely a task for the university, or maybe even not primarily a task for the university. Every human institution that shapes us, our families, our neighborhoods, religious institutions, employers, even sports teams, are engaged in this work in some way. Well, what I've described to you is more or less the philosophy of student engagement at the Human Flourishing Program. We want to engage with students in both of these ways. So we have given quite a bit of thought to our different activities and how they fit into this mission. And this is a partial list of some of the work that we do, some of the different kinds of activities and programming that we've introduced at Harvard. Uh, you can see the, 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 the list in the middle, our research, our public events, things like lectures, our four credit courses, our small group discussions, reading groups, and then kind of one-on-one -on -one mentorship. They're arranged in a very particular order. The activities at the top have the greatest reach, or at least the greatest potential reach, especially now with the internet. There is, in principle, um, no kind of real boundary to how far a, a research um, paper or even a, a popular publication uh, can reach. We our, our program has recently featured kind of unexpectedly but wonderfully in the New York Times, and that has a potential reach of millions. Um, and so it can, it can go quite far. Um, but few people have their characters most profoundly shaped by an encounter with an article in the New York Times. Uh, and there may be some, um, but, but that's not how most people, most people work. The activities at the bottom uh, have a much narrower reach, but potentially much greater individual impact. And if you think back on your own life and you ask, well, what are those things or events that have most shaped you, you probably think about individuals who've been very important in your life, um, or maybe groups or, or, or friends or relationships. So your parents, a teacher who became more than a teacher, became a friend, maybe a member of the clergy. So this little image shows trade-offs. But it also allows us to think about how these different factors fit together in a larger strategy to promote flourishing at a university like Harvard. We don't try to pick a place. Um, of course, we, are, we have a limited staff. Um, I, 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 I do most of this work myself with some great help from other people in our program and some allies on campus. Um, but even then, we can't do it all. But we try to do all of these things more or less simultaneously. Um, and we've been more successful at some than others. Our research output has been very strong, especially in the social sciences, uh, social sciences uh, for kind of the entirety of our program's existence. Um, in, a rel in the relatively short time we've been doing this, uh, the student, particularly more intensive student work, we've seen a growing number of students in reading groups and meeting with, with uh, researchers or with me for, for mentorship of various kinds. Uh, four credit courses have actually been one of the trickier things for us to offer, simply because we're not based in an, in a, um, in an academic department. I think this calendar year we'll have three courses taught by researchers at our program. We hope to grow that over time. Uh, but very broadly speaking, we want to engage as many people as Har at Harvard as we can, uh, starting with the top, and then move those who are interested uh, down the ladder uh, to more intensive investment at the bottom in reading groups or in mentorship. Um, it's, to it's completely fine. We recognize that not every faculty member or student at Harvard will engage with our program uh, very, very directly or intensively, um, but some will, and some will want to go further. So I'll give you an example. You can imagine a student, Joe Harvard, who uh, comes to a public event. So we recently had a public lecture. We had a philosopher named Agnes Callard from the University of Chicago come. She was really wonderful, and talk about Aristotle's approach to disagreement. Um, it was quite, quite academic, but quite good, uh, quite, quite good lecture. Uh, Brendan uh, recently organized a really interesting conference on the future of work with a, from a range of perspectives, which you can actually find on our, on our program web, uh, YouTube site if you're interested in it. Um, so imagine that Joe Harvard comes to one of these sorts of events. Now, Joe's friends come with him, and they're happy to get along with their life and do other things, but Joe wants to learn more. So he joins the reading group I run, which is currently discussing classic texts on speech, disagreement, and intellectual diversity. Uh, so we, we, uh, 
We started with John Stuart Mill, a short excerpt from his On Liberty. Um, we're going to read um, you know, a kind of a critic from the left, Herbert Marcuse. Uh, we are going to read um, Vaclav Havel on, on intellectual conformity and courage, a kind of a range of texts. Over time, Joe and I become friends, and he decides that I'm someone he can trust to help him investigate questions that are, are preoccupying him. And so we start to meet regularly for coffee, and we read a book together. Um, I'm, uh, I like coffee, but I, I would prefer to drink three to four cups of coffee a week, maybe at most, but I find myself sitting in coffee shops a lot and consuming more caffeine than is probably good for me um, because this is where I'm able to meet students uh, at, at, the, at the moment. So this is more or less the structure um, of our program, and I'm happy to talk about any of the details of this more, uh, maybe in the Q&A and after. But I want to conclude with just a couple of key lessons. Um, and the first um, is, 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 I think, an important one, um, and is that we should, we should be recognize the limitations of efficiency. And I put this as a negative because I think we all recognize the value of scale instinctively. Of course, it seems better to reach a million people than to reach 10 people. And that, that often is the case. But we need to recognize that efficiency can be a danger and a temptation as well. Um, I've had some really excellent conversations over the last couple of days with leaders from UNIR uh, and, and just some of the amazing things they're able to do with the internet to reach the globe and scale very, very quickly. That has immense value in teaching. It's harder for the actual encouragement of, of a love of virtue uh, for the formation of, of friendships. Uh, there are some things that are more difficult to scale than others. Uh, you cannot parent efficiently. Um, you're just going to have to not sleep sometimes. That, sometime that's how it works. Um, children need intensive love and care. Uh, you cannot love your spouse efficiently. Um, I sometimes buy my wife flowers on special events, and it would save me a lot of money if I bought them wholesale and gave them all to her at once and said, this is for, for birthdays and anniversaries for the rest of our lives. Um, so just know that it happened, and it, and it won't happen again. Um, I suspect that that would not have the same meaning. Uh, that going to the, to, the, to the flower shop and picking up flowers regularly uh, would do. Character is largely formed in relationships, not exclusively. Uh, all, we can also encounter ideas in books and elsewhere. But relationships are important. So as we think about how to promote flourishing and character, we need to think very, very carefully about what things we can scale and what things we can't scale. And we need to think about how we take the scalable things and translate them uh, into opportunities that are more uh, immediate and, hu and human and direct uh, and, and, and smaller. Because character is formed in community, uh, we have to uh, try to welcome people into communities. Not every student in Harvard wants to engage with our program. In fact, most probably never will. But for those who do, we want to create a community of people who are trained to use this vocabulary of virtue uh, and flourishing and who are similarly committed to growth. Uh, and, and to pursuing virtue and wisdom and flourishing. Uh, there is just a limit to what any of us, even if we are very engaged uh, mentors, there's a limit to what any of us can do. Um, but if we can form communities that reinforce this pursuit, we can actually multiply our efforts. Uh, so we want to uh, be very careful, uh, try to think, think very carefully about how we can create communities of people who are actually pursuing these same things. And we hope that the people we teach and the people we mentor will become teachers on their own. Uh, there's, a, there's a professor uh, at, at Harvard, Arthur Brooks, that some of you may know, uh, who is, uh, writes quite widely on happiness. And he teaches a course at the Harvard uh, Business School uh, on happiness that is so oversubscribed that I think there's three or four students who want to get in for everyone who can. And he told me what he's done is he takes everyone who didn't get in uh, and he says that you have to actually uh, um, join a group at where you'll be taught this material by your peers. Um, so he has the course, and then he has a lot of other people who are actually teaching and covering the same material in different forums and, and, and venues uh, throughout, the, um, throughout the university. And, and amazingly, although it's very difficult to get business students to actually do, uh, at least at, at places like Harvard, to do things other than networking, um, they've actually been quite engaged in this. So we want to create communities that allow this to happen. Uh, and my third comment is that we want to think very carefully in the kinds of people who can do this work. Um, if it were the case that only the truly virtuous or the fully virtuous could teach virtue, if only people who were flourishing maximally could help others to flourish, there'd, there'd be frankly very little hope for any of us um, because none of us can claim that. Um, but we do need people who are committed, uh, who, to do the, who are doing this work uh, on our behalf to, sh to share commitments and ideals 
and we do want them to have a common vision for flourishing. Um, and this is, this is, I think, uh, a, quite important, uh, a quite important thing. So we are a program that is, is, thinks a lot about staffing, and, and we may be having to staff in the future, and, and, and this, is, uh, this is something that is important. All right, well, just all, I started on the Harvard campus. I'll end on the Harvard campus. Uh, this is one of the gates um, at Har that enter into kind of Harvard Yard, and uh, it says above, you can see, enter to grow in wisdom. Um, I hope that's more and more true of your universities, just as I hope it's more and more true of mine. Thank you so much. Thank you.